How you doing, guys? Um, so I've got about half an hour for this one. So, you know, we adapt, we change. So I've got two sessions, so we're going to split it into two. So we'll do a bit before lunch and then do a little bit afterwards. Um, but the session I'm going to do this morning, um, it follows on a little bit from what you heard from John earlier, is I'm just going to give you a bit of my experience and insight over what happened in the pandemic. So I'm going to ask you all a question. Right? Hands up here if you feel that you have got closer and more connected at a deeper level with your clients over and since the pandemic than you were before. Hands up if you think you have. And hands up if you haven't. Hands up if you're just not sure. Hands up if you're already, already bored with what I'm talking about. Okay, I feel like I should be on Zoom. Can you all see me okay? Can you see my slides? Can you hear me? So I'm going to cover off that and tell you what's happened and also why those of you who have connected better with your clients, why that's happened, and those of you who haven't, what you can do. And then afterwards, we're going to go into a bit about creating content. Who here th struggles with creating content? Yeah, I kind of thought so, right? With not knowing what to do, what to say, where to post it. So Ruth will go, we'll go into the, some of the detail. What I'll do is I'll look at it from a strategic point of view as to why you should be creating content, what sort of create, content you should be creating, and what sort of stories you should be telling. Sound OK? Cool. By the way, who's seen me present before? Yay. Cool. So you all know this is interactive, right? Yeah, this is like you and me working together to create a wonderful little world. That sounds quite good. Who are? Don't like it. It's not interactive. Do you? No, no. It will be a. If you're not interacting, I'll just. Yeah, it's a bit flat. So um, I'll show. Put this up at the end. If you want to kind of join AE, simplest thing to do is scan the QR code. If you don't know how to do that, you put your camera on your phone, you hold it up, and that does the rest of it. Um, or just ask me. Um, I am the founder of Aesthetic Entrepreneurs. I've been in the aesthetics market for a very long time, close to coming up for 20 years. Um, started off selling fillers and toxins uh, with Allergan. Um, I've pretty much sold everything there is. I've worked on most projects, you know, skincare, capital equipment, toxins, filler, injectables. Worked with every type of business from a small independent startup through to some of the largest businesses in, in the country, in, in Europe. Um, also worked with manufacturers, suppliers. I know this market well, and I love this market. I mean it. I don't know how to do anything else. But one of the things I really do enjoy, sorry, that's just, by the way, we do events, right? Um, this has got nothing to do with the talk. It's just a brilliant photo from Saturday that I wanted to share with everybody. <laughs> so, um, I'm an author. You've all got a copy of Changing Faces. Um, you know, take it, enjoy it, read it. Leave me a review on Amazon if you fancy. I'll sign it for you later if you like. Um, but pr pr predominantly, I'm the founder of Aesthetic Entrepreneurs, and what we do is we're essentially a growth hacker, business builder, and what we do is we want to create a community, as, as Haley said, but it's working with humans, working with people. I like to work with people to inspire them, and our mission is to grow successful you know, entrepreneurs and successful businesses by working with the people, the human beings, the entrepreneurs behind them. We work with you, then you can drive your business better. Our prince, we, we have very, very strong values. So about progression, we want to be at the forefront of things, you know, theories, tech, tech, techniques, digital growth, evolution, innovation. Um, we, it's about power, empowerment, as well as being powerful. So not just about teaching you guys to fish, but you know, giving you the tools to be able to go and really achieve the goals, to achieve what you want to do, and principle. There's no right way to do the wrong thing. This market has a dark side, right? We all know that. We don't step into that side of things. So it's all about discovering yourself, and then from that, you'll discover your business. Now, back into the story. So this was 2019. You know, I made most of my money from, from events. We were you know, a physical business. I look at this photo and think John was talking about resilience. The resilient thing in that picture are the buttons on my shirt. <laughs> Man, they were doing a good job. This was the Linton workshop in 2019, the one that John talked about before. Who was in, who was in the room with me at that time? That's great, great to see you again. But I, carry, you know, I presented at Royal College of Physicians, talked about you know, shy kids not getting sweets, about the importance of creating content. More workshops, our own event, and we were doing well. This was the Aesthetic Medicine 2020, and then we all know what happened after that, right? Pow. Now, 
it react, my, essentially 90 odd percent of my turnover just disappeared overnight. So did yours, right? Yeah? You know, we were kind of aligned. I wasn't making any money and neither were you guys. So how did we move through it? How, what, what happened? This message came through. So a lot of the screenshots and things I, I do through on this is all taken from the Aesthetic Entrepreneurs group. You know, who, who felt like this? You know? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it was hard. It was really, really hard. But I challenged my, my market and I challenged myself. And this quote's taken from, actually from the US Navy SEAL. So, so you may not know I was in the Royal Navy for eight years. Um, and, um, you know, we, we met with, you know, some special forces guys and, you know, different, different um, uh, navies of different countries. And the US Navy SEALs saying that in times of crisis, people don't rise to the challenge. They drop to the highest level of their training. They say the highest level of their training. And I adapted it for, for COVID because I think, do you know what? It was down to character. And I challenged myself and I challenged the market to do better, not to allow it to break you, you know? We were gonna come out the other side of this. We might not know how, but we were gonna do it. And this was a slide that I created <laughs> right at the beginning, right? Know your audience, stick a photo of Chris Hemsworth on and everyone starts listening to you. But it was like, who are you gonna be? What kind of businesses are you gonna have? Are you gonna be leaner? Are you gonna shake off the, you know, the elements of the business that haven't been working, rework it and grow? Or are you just gonna let it break you? And that, that slide, a carry on, all that carried it all the way through AE, we still use it now. Shout out to Linton, right? They reacted really, really quickly. Look at the date on that webinar. Sorry, your date was wrong. It wasn't the 27th of March. It was the 17th of March. What day did we go into lockdown? Right. They're already ahead of the game. Sorry about the screenshot. Hayley looks like she's singing. John looks like I don't know what I said <laughs> to him. He's not happy with me. But anyway, um, and we reacted and we started getting content out, coaching. You know, I look at this and I get stitched up. I was two minutes before I'm going live. I said to my wife, Amy, can you do me a coffee, please? And I remember this one so clearly. She goes, yeah, look at the mug. It sounds like a Hugh Jackman mug. <laughs> so I'm going live with a gold Hugh Jackman mug, learning about not taking yourself too seriously. We, it, it was hard, right? The first half a year was very, very difficult. You know, that was us in January, July. You know, you're in the weeds, right? It, it got challenging. <sighs> I love this slide, right? You know, some managed to furlough, some didn't. For me, I got absolutely zero, no government support whatsoever. I had to trade all the way through. Anybody else have that? Yeah, right? So furlough businesses did it one way, we had to do it another way. But what happened? It worked, right? So I'll, I'll explain this slide for you. So this is essentially about 18 months of sales data from some of my coaching clients in Aesthetic Entrepreneurs. So we're going straight from, from here, which is essentially March or Q1 2020 through to middle of 2021. 20, so you can see, here we go. So the blue line essentially is a, a bigger business in the north down to the smaller businesses. I mean, essentially, they're all rank, ranked on revenue. So you can see kind of who's bringing in the most amount of money, but the trend is the same. Q1, as expected, lockdown one hits, bang. Revenue drops. Now, some of those businesses bottomed out. Some of them didn't. I'll come on to the reasons why they didn't in a minute. Then we go through latent demand. You remember that? All of a sudden, open up again, pow, off it goes. Everybody's up, everybody's making money. And then into lockdown two, which wasn't really a lockdown, let's be honest, into lockdown three, which was. Most of the businesses, the takeaway from this is all of them grew. All of them grew. Year on year, quarter on quarter, they all grew during a pandemic. How? How did that happen? I'll come on to that. We'll talk about how that happened, why that happened. But the other thing that happened in all of this is, is Linton launched Focus Jewel right at the start of the third lockdown. Who does that? You know? Yeah. But we, sp it wasn't, we saw something. We knew there was something happening in the market. And I was working with Haley over this year as well. And it wasn't, you see this data and you just think, well, what's all that, what's behind it? Why, why did it recover? And this was the thing that triggered my thinking. 
was Sony re launched PlayStation 5 during lockdown. Who had to buy one? <laughs> Who tried to buy one? Whose kids demanded one? Yeah, 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 yeah right? Couldn't get them for love nor money. Fastest growing games console in history. Sold at 500 pounds. Sold out. Still can't get them. Still a waiting list. 500 quid a pop when no one had any money, apparently, during lockdown, yeah? Who's some other winners during this period? Anyone want to take a guess on whose share price this is? So from $23 in March to 164 in February, there was 12 months of incredible growth. Who? Amazon was one. Zoom, yeah, they went up as well. Amazon went up. Peloton. Yeah? The worst comment made in the last year, the most out of touch comment, get off your Pelotons and get back to the office. No, <laughs> said the world who bought Pelotons. But they retail at 1,200 quid. They sold shed loads of them. They're not the only ones. Big ticket items were selling. And the reason is this. I had this, this comment, was on, I was listening to a podcast earlier on, and um, podcast is a guy called um, uh, Reid Hoffman, who's the founder of LinkedIn. And he was interviewing um, a lady called Jennifer Lopez, not J-Lo, but she's the founder of a, a business called um, Rent the Runway, where you can basically rent designer gear. And she was saying that the COVID, the pandemic, was the, and I love this quote, the greatest accelerant to the experience economy in history. Experience economy. Lock that in for a minute, because that's what's changed, and that's what's driving the focus of entrepreneurs, and we're driving the market towards a slightly different way of thinking. I and mean, it's based off data. Yeah, take a photo of it. It's a great comment. You can have these slides if you want them. It's not a problem. But it's based off data. It's based off evidence. So my experience over how, how aesthetic businesses tend to grow is kind of like this in this wave. So we all start off in our little startup phase, OK? So essentially, you don't really have much of a clue what you're doing. Let's be honest about it, right? In startup, you've all been through it. Who in startup knew what they were doing? No, right? Not a clue. Not even me. You go through your startup phase, and then essentially you go into boutique, what I call a boutique phase, which is where you're generally working from home, home-based clinic, or a very, very small. You're renting a room somewhere, probably single. Um, um, if you've got a small machine, or there's just only one thing you're doing. And you're in that phase for quite a long time, quite a long time. Then you hit lifestyle. So a lifestyle business is essentially now you're starting to grow. It's starting to pay more money. You're starting to have to think a little bit differently about it. You, know, you might have to register as a limited company, fat register, all those sorts of things at that point. And then after that, if you put your foot down, you can reach what we call a performance business quite quickly. And a performance business, by its nature, says that you have to perform. Business has to generate revenue to pay its bills, to staff your own salary all those aspects of things. So, and then from there, we've got high performance and corporate. High performance businesses are essentially turbocharged performance businesses doing good money. And then corporate is a selection or a chain of high performing businesses all working together. All makes sense? Yeah? Can you all see yourself in there somewhere? Cool, right, okay, good. So, so that's how, how the market shaped up. And what we discovered during that whole period is that we found a bit of a blueprint so myself and my um, partner in AE, Rick O'Neill, who runs the digital side of things, you know, we had a lot of time to think and to analyze and work what was working, what wasn't working. And there were certain traits, and there were certain things and activities that directly related to the business growth. And bear in mind, this was working while you were closed. What, entrepreneurial thinking, I'll go into these in a little bit of detail. Entrepreneurial thinking, a diversified business model, clearly differentiated, and believe it or not, above average pricing. That was, these were the common threads that we saw in all of those businesses that all grew. Would you like to know more? Yeah, good. Look at you engaged. Look at you. You're leaning in. Oh. So, so what happened? So you saw that magic date, 17th of March. This was essentially how the businesses or the aesthetics market worked on the 16th of March. And then, in the red, was the 17th of March. You couldn't do this anymore. 
So you made your money and your contact with, your, with clients face to face more often than not. So you got paid when they walked in the door. Reactive, they came in and said, hey, could you do this for me? And you went, yeah, no problem, I can do that for you. Easy, right, and reactive. Everybody was talking about treatments and products. Very much a heavy reliance on selling treatments, selling products, talking about treatments, talking about products. Numbers. How many people have you got in your, on your Instagram page? How many you know, likes are you getting? All of that became, was important. And using influence to, to drive credibility. All of these things was how the market worked. And then all of a sudden, that dramatic shift, I shall change this side. None of it worked. None of that worked at all. It didn't work because you couldn't open the doors. So you had to think about things differently. This is where the entrepreneurial thinking came into it. And all of a sudden, this was the thing. And John used a word, an R word earlier, resilience. I'm going to throw a diff another one at you. It's called relevance. Write that one down, right? Because at some point in your business life, you're going to become more relevant than you are in different times. And what happened with the set of entrepreneurs, I'd been talking about this for a while, but what happened at lockdown was all of a sudden we became far more relevant because we've been talking about it, but also we knew how to do it. So myself and Rick went bang, that's it. And we drove it. So we had awareness. You need business, you need brand awareness, which comes from content, but you also need to have relevance as well. That's what drives sales. At some point, you're going to be more relevant than others. So, one to many. Broaden your reach out digitally. Being proactive. Talking about the solutions that you, prov that you provide. Which means you've also got to talk about some problems as well, right? Experience focused. Experience economy. Talking about how you change lives. What's the impact that you have on people emotionally? What's the impact you have? Engagement. It's not about numbers. It's not about numbers in the community. It's about not having people in you've got in the room. It's about having the right people in the room. And that's important. That's key. And the last point is about leadership. It's all right, mate. Last one is about leadership. Lead communities. Lead your clients. Tell them what you're doing. You know, but be direct and not relying on influence. Because influence is paid for. Leadership is earned. And this was what was working. All of a sudden, we saw shifts in people, shifts in businesses, shifts in revenue. You know, it all started to click together. All make sense? Yeah? So, a diversification of a business model. And I will walk through this in, t in time, because this is probably one of the most important models that we have at AE. Because... We look at how income versus equity, so income, what revenue are you gen generating, sales, equity, but value, business value, resilience, all those sorts of things. So income, short-term income, people walking through the door, buying something from you, yeah? Okay? Now, if your business is totally reliant on that particular box, it's a really anxious place to be because you've got to have a great month every month great quarter, every quarter, to make money. Otherwise, you have a bad quarter, what happens? Don't make any money. The pandemic, I had, we had businesses who come into us saying we were doing 40 grand a month and ran out of money in seven days. Seven days. Pow, no resilience at all. Because everything was totally geared in that particular box. Looking at uh, subscriptions, so that's you know, treatment planning. You know, how do you bring that sales journey over a longer period of time? You know, a great model is if your subscription revenue pays your bills, then everything starts to get a little bit easier. Because, you know, imagine waking up on the first of the month. I mean, who can do this, right, in your businesses? I'd be interested to know. Wake up on the first of the month and all of your bills are paid. <laughs> but I built it, right? I built this. So that's one of the things we want to get to. Then into online retail, so creating that upsell opportunity. So who here has a website? Okay, who here has an online, can I, could, can I buy something from your website right now? Hands up if I can do that. Okay, look around, hands up really high, right? Look around, okay? Now, without going too dramatic, we've just been through an incredible experience, and yet still, 80% of the room only have that 
this is why you need to diversify. So you've got to move out, grow, boom. Because once you get all of these boxes working, so you can sales, yeah, people walk through the door, give you money. The business relationship grows and develops. And then all of a sudden, they're buying treatment plans from you and programs where you're locking in a bit more longer-term revenue. You're upselling them onto your online offering, whatever that is. You know, we can, we can, you can look at what that kind of looks like and how that shapes up. But then in the top right, where I put it in red, is for me, it's, it's kind of the, it's the bit that makes all this work, is brand. And that's you, the individual, the person, the entrepreneur at the middle of all of this, making this work. And that's where we're going to go into the second part later on, talking about content. Because it's content and the creation of the right content that drives that model. Does that make sense? Yeah? Who's sitting there thinking... Shit. <laughs> right, okay. That's good. That's a good. It's a, you know, it's an awakening, right? It's kind of from here, once you understand the, the challenge and vulnerability. Vulnerability is great, but, you know, the mistake is not fixing it. That's the mistake. So how can we fix it? So I'm just going to... All right, for time, I'm going to grab a little bit of water. Does anybody got any questions at this point? Or are you just sort of sitting in stunned silences? I'm going at a bit of a pace, I know, but... It's a lot to get in. Okay. So, so you took that, that model, those boxes, and you kind of laid it a slightly different way. You kind of come up with this. So this is um, an ascending transaction model. It's essentially, this is your business plan. So, gifts. Who wants to give me an example of a, of a gift? So... Gift is, by the way, something that you give without any thought of return. Who's got something in their business that their clients can take or get from them with nothing asked in exchange? Knowledge. You? knowledge. How would you provide that knowledge? What's the mechanism of you giving that gift of knowledge to them? Talking, educating them. How do you do that? Ah, generally one-to-one, -one, but I try and put it in my social media. Spot on. Exactly. Thank you. Education, honesty, insight, experience. That, content. All of that. Content is the gift. You're, you're I mean, how, who's been in this market for more than 20 years? Right. Who's been in it for more than 10 years? Okay, there's a lot... There's a lot of, you've got a lot of, a lot of that education, insight and experience and honesty. Honesty is a really valuable thing to give, authenticity. So it's not something that you're, you know, you're going to lose. It just builds trust when you give it away and people can just connect with you. Then when they come in for your entry level, um, you know, services, they're already pre-sold to a degree. They already know what you, what you stand for, vision and values who you are, what your ethos is, because you've told them, you know, in your philosophy, your treatment philosophy through your website, you know, you've really connected with them. So the trust is already there. So when it comes into the, right, you know, I want you to, I want to, you to pay for your consultation, there's no argument, they just do it. From there into bread and butter. So you're, it's your, you know, it's generally what you do the most of, and it's what kind of pays the bills. And the upsell is where your profit lives. And your job as entrepreneurs, as business owners, is to move people from there to there. Pretty straightforward when you think of it that way. But the way you do it essentially is your business model. Still with me? Good. Okay. So, the stories you tell directly influence how well that works and directly influence the money in your bank. So, two different experiences, and these are two different stories. They're both valid. Story number one. Our clinic has a treatment that's really good at helping people, and we can help you. You should buy from us because we've won all sorts of awards. Here's all the list of things we can do and the prices, and you can have a discount if you can buy from me now. Is that a familiar story? Yeah? Treat well. Treat, treat well? Yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong, right? There's no bad. There's no good or bad in these. They're just different, different approaches. One essentially is a sales-led approach, and one is a marketing-led approach. One is push, and one is pull. We totally understand the challenges you have and the goals you want to achieve. We also understand you have lots of fears and questions. 
Over the years, we've helped hundreds of people like you, and we have created this amazing video blog podcast with 10 top tips to help you. Which is more compelling? Buy my shit or let's be friends? You like buy my shit? You would, Esther. You're just being awkward. No, I'm kidding. Let's be friends. Yeah, there, there's a balance to them all, right? For me, personally, I like to lead with let's be friends. Because then, of course, buy my shit comes down. Like, of course it's there. You know, we're in business, right? We've got to make some sales. We've got to make some money. Everyone's got to eat. But if you lead with that, you hit less resistance early on, and your pricing can go up. So, so the stories, the type of stories that you tell, the blue stories are... Commodities, goods, and services. It's about essentially what you sell rather than how you do it. And a, you know, an idea of a, of a commodity. I've used salt as an example before. Salt isn't a commodity, right? But there are lots of different types of salt, aren't there? You've got the salt that you put on your chips. You've got the sea salt that goes in the pasta. And then you've got the, the little bowl of pink Himalayan salt that sits on the table next to the olive oil and the balsamic vinegar. It's all salt, right? It's all the same stuff. No. One is a, commo is a commoditized product. The salt that goes on your chips, the salt that goes everywhere, it's a commoditized product. If you think about this Himalayan sea salt, in fact, even though it's pronounced Himalayan sea salt in some places, I hear, um, it tells a story. What's the story it's telling? See, right? The dinner party, how refined you are, you know, how, much cult how cultured you are. It's telling a story to your guests. And that's what you want to be telling to your clients, is telling a story. So you can tell them the story about the product, services, etc. But in this box, so box number three, if you tell the stories exclusively about the service you can provide, what tends to happen? Any ideas? Any ideas? What tends to happen to your business if you just talk about the services you provide? Yeah, it can be more spoken about. What else? Sorry. No, no, no. They can... You, you nailed it. You, they can... They can find it elsewhere. It has zero differentiation. It's the same thing I can get anywhere else. So what happens? What goes down? Price. You get price pressure. Massive amounts of price pressure. Oh, the market's really noisy. I can't differentiate myself. No one will buy my stuff. It's all horrendous. It's because most of the stories you're telling are in that box. If you're getting price pressure, it's because you're in there. Now, it's not easy, I granted, but I call it the barrier of apathy because the next two boxes are quite hard to get into, but you've got its consistency that does it and telling experiences and transformations. And the difference between top and bottom is at the top bit, it's you talking. At the bottom, it's your clients talking. If you can get your clients talking about how you have changed their lives, the impact you have had on them and their family, you're immediately going to differentiate yourself from everybody else. Agree? Yeah? So if you haven't got a mechanism of capturing feedback, testimonials, reviews, anything like that, create it. And don't overthink it as well. So I just put it in my head. I'll just give you a tip, right? The gold standard for, for content, for me, client-created content, is video. It is. The gold standard is video. But you know, weirdly, what works just as well is a screenshot of a Facebook post because it's authenticity that people want. So Google reviews and Facebook reviews are great, but you know what? A screenshot of a Facebook post is sometimes just as good. So if they've put, you know, do you mind if I use this? I'll drop your name off. No problem. You can screenshot it put it there, everybody knows it's from you, and they know it's honest, so you don't have to have the name. It's quite an interesting little quirk, but if you, you know, want to need to start somewhere, just start screenshotting, go through your face, go through your social media, and just start screenshotting every time someone said something nice about you, stick it in a little folder called a brag file, and just roll it out as content. I have my brag file, oh, 250 little things that people have said. And the other thing about that is sometimes when you're feeling a little bit down, you just go through it. And it's like, yeah, I am awesome. Bitch. So, make sense? Good. Okay. So, um, 
when Charlotte put the talk together, it's like it was the one million pound business. So I left this slide in just to sort of honour of Charlotte, but I have kind of diversified off that topic, that topic, as you can probably tell. Reason it's important, I think, to have short-term income and long-term income is to balance this. Because if you can get people on rev a recurring revenue model, it takes the pressure off you having to sell. Who here really enjoys selling? Like, really enjoys selling? Wake up in the morning and go, yeah, I love to sell. Who's that? So Haley, right? Thank you. There's got to be one person. I quite enjoy it, but I'm actually more, I prefer coaching, training, educating, speaking. But I can sell if I need to. I have to. It's my business, right? Who here would do anything but sell? Literally, it's the last thing you would really want to do. Okay, there's a couple. So most of you are in the middle. Fine. So you need to work on this. Where's your price point? Where's your average transactional value per client? So every time they come in, what do they average they spend? And then where in here? Because you'll, be, you'll find them somewhere in there. If you can get, so let's say, for example, you know, make it nice and easy. You can get 500 people to spend two grand a year with you. You've got a million pound business. Who here doesn't think they can handle 500 clients? Doesn't think they can handle 500 clients. Okay, so you've got a little bit of work to do on capacity. Who here doesn't think that they could get a client to spend £2,000 with them? Okay, so you've got a little bit of work to do on product, on your product suite. But most of you are already saying you're there. Now you've got the focus jewel, right? So, yeah, well done, Hayley. Now you've got the focus jewel, but now you've got, the, now you've got to create the strategy to do that, and that comes, that's a slightly different approach. It's looking at your client base and how you can work with them to make that happen. And actually, interestingly, that's what we're going to be looking at after lunch. So how did I respond to you know, the pandemic? Well, I already had, I already had a community. We've got 1,500 people in the Aesthetic Entrepreneurs. About 10% are active at any one time. And because I had the community, it was easy -er, easier for me to mobilize that community to be able to communicate to them how I felt, what the business, what we could do for them, share the, the positive results we had, and get them to buy from me over the pandemic. And that's what kept me going, you know? But with a caveat, right? Don't build your castle on other people's land. So the conversations we're having with guys about Linton's, about digital strategy, digital technologies. If you over-rely on social media, when this happens, you've got a big problem. So who was, who was affected badly by Facebook and Instagram going down? Why I can't get in? Yeah. You know, so, some people were completely devastated by it. And bit, but if it disappeared forever, who would still be able to communicate to their client base? Hands up if you could, you could still do that. Good. That's really good. Because a lot of people have abdicated the responsibility for communicating the marketing to social media. You've still got to do a, keep an email list and a database and a CRM system. You've still got to be able to find a you know, phone number. Just have their phone number. And that was a really good reminder to me to, to make sure that you diversify your, your, your marketing mix, that you've still got a marketing mix. The other thing is not to put too much of a downer on it, but I don't think we're out of the woods yet. There's a, a friend of mine called Jason Greystone. He's... Um, Big wealth, man, wealth manager, trainer, entrepreneur, investor. He's got a great podcast called Always Free. I listen to it. I, I, I listen to podcasts quite a lot. There's a podcast called Always Free. Um, and we were talking on Saturday. We think that 2022 is a correction coming because you've got a bit of a perfect storm of rising interest rates, rising inflation, and um, supply chain issues. So... We've got to be aware of this. The resilience has got to be there. So going back to the business model and the stuff that you've seen before, build it in. You've got a bit of time, but probably not a lot. So I decided I'd, I'd get all my content off of social media. So I built a platform called Matrix, uh, which is where all of our systems... Who's use, anybody using that? Okay. I've got to do some work on getting people to use the platform. But it's about 1,000 hours of content, courses, podcasts, blogs... You know, everything I've said to you today, if you want to go back and refresh yourself, it's all on Matrix. Go and have a look at that. 
And we've got some really amazing partners. You know, Linton, absolutely, you know, one of our key partners with what we're doing. But, you know, as Hayley said, we're trying to build, a, you know, a community around the aesthetics market of people who have shared vision and values, but also helping you guys to drive your business is in the right way. That's what I think, you know, that, that is the right way. Diversified diversify business model, entrepreneurial thinking, differentiation, and uh, above average pricing. So we've got, there's a, f a whole load of courses that we do, workshops that we've got, events that we've got good doing. We just did a fantastic event on, um, yeah, I know this one. My <laughs> mate said he's got a ridiculous ego. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's true. But, you know, we've got, we had an event, uh, the GSD, that ran last weekend, which was really, really good fun. So we do those a couple of times a year. So growth hacking programs. So essentially, how, where, business, where businesses tend to tail off is around here. And it's a bit of a kind of a, a, a perfect storm hits, which is lack of understanding of basic principles around marketing, generally around marketing, selling and marketing. How do I make money? Unless someone's actually really taught you how to make money, difficult to know how to do it. So not understanding that, poor levels of differentiation, okay? No one's taught you how to, st how to stand out in a crowded market. All you're ever hearing about is Facebook ads and Google ads, but no one's really talked about you know, how to actually really effectively talk in boxes four and five, because they're the important ones. They really are important. So, and then all of a sudden the marketing stops working. So what happens when people's marketing stops working is you get a bit of panic. Panic sets in, and then all of a sudden you press the offer button. And that drives your average sale value down. So you're making less money, which means you can do less. Or you go to the debt, you know, the debt box and start taking overdrafts, and you hit this spiral. And generally what happens is when I pick clients up, they're in this bit here, and it's panic. They're on fire. So we have to look at what fires are burning, which ones we're going to leave, which ones we're going to put out. And it's quite tiring for me and them. So all I do is on the growth hacking programs is we start here, right? Let's start here. Clear plan. What is it you want to achieve? Absolute clarity of thought really helps the people move forward. Then we diversify your business model. Look at your skills, look at your weaknesses, the stuff you like to do, the stuff you don't want to do, um, stuff you want to do, and put it into a plan. That gives you differentiation. It creates a bit of space between you and the market. And then we help you put your prices up. Because unless you've done this bit first, you have absolutely no idea of your value. And it's value that keeps your pricing up. Confidence keeps prices up. Look at the market, right? Stock market is totally driven on confidence. Yes, the world is going in a great place and I'm happy. As soon as confidence drops, their prices drop. Same thing in this market. So the growth hacking programs are essentially what we do to help you move all the way through that from the growth hacker which is a startup package launch pad which is aimed at the boutique businesses uh accelerator which moves you from a kind of a boutique into a lifestyle and then we've got the performance uh program which is aimed at taking businesses th to sc scale essentially to scale up with exit etc etc are you happy now yeah good thank you My, I, no i'm not being not being flippant but thank you um so I'll pick that up. Is that okay? Shall I pick it up after lunch? Yeah? Okay, look, I'm here. If you've got any questions, just grab me around and um, I'll see you uh, in a little while.